Our next speaker is the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers. She's featured in Jet Magazine. And she serves on the board of Foundation Beyond Belief, Mandisa, Mandisa Thomas. Thomas. Thank you very much, everyone. How are you doing this afternoon? Good, thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a few people and uh, give thanks to the, uh, the Secular Student Alliance at the University of Akron for inviting me this afternoon to speak, especially at such an important conference to which is near and dear to my heart, which is open sexual expression and healthy sexuality. And I also like to mention, I'd like to thank Daryl Ray. Um, our organization is affiliated with Recovering from Religion. We do host a chapter in the Atlanta area, and I just wanted to mention that in case for those of you who did not know. Just a bit about myself and my background. I was born and raised in New York City in one of the housing um, projects. So I am from a under economic developed neighborhood which as it is, seems to be the norm. It is not normal for everyone. That's not the case for every black person in this country, but I can say that that is my experience. However, I had a mother who was very progressive minded and still is very progressive minded. I was not raised religious at all. Um, my mother actually um, advocated for progressive measures in the community, in fact, one of my earliest memories was of her showing as PTA president of my elementary school, a documentary called Babies Making Babies, and it discussed teenage pregnancy in the black community. So she was very much um, you know, about social change, uh, learned a lot about black history, some of the social injustice that we faced. However, when it came to the subject of sex, as a teenager, she said, you have plenty of time for that. So as far as personal wise, that wasn't supposed to be an area that I was supposed to explore. Of course, that didn't happen. <laughs> but uh, over the years and into my now being 37, uh, as a teenager, I became kind of obsessed with or preoccupied or interested in sex at a young age. And I can say that throughout my experience, I have learned to develop that and also come to terms with some things that went on in my life and understand the dynamic that, that goes along with being raised in the black community in my neighborhood and also with the societal norms that we all go through. My presentation today is to discuss, I will be discussing uh, some things that we go through in the black community or some of the, some of the issues that are prevalent. Let me, um, okay. Got it. It's called sanctified hoes. <laughs> now, um, how many of you have heard of this TV show called Preachers of LA that is now on the Oxygen channel? Uh, it, it debuted last week. I saw the first episode uh, last week. I caught parts of the second episode. That was just about as much as I could take. But I would like to show a preview of this show. I'd like to give you a preview of it so you can see for yourself. <laughs> Okay, is the volume up on here? Sin, sins of omission, sins of commission, mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus. Every chain can be broken. Mm -hmm. How do you go back? I'm going 
I'm William Fay. My name is Jay Hazel. My name is Nolan Jones. to what tends to be valued in our communities. And if this doesn't show how alarming this is, I don't know what else can. Um, this show, I guess, is attempting to show these, these guys as uh, human. They have problems, just like everybody else. But they have amassed a, 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 they have amassed a, a huge amount of wealth as a result of this style, this very evangelical, very rock style um, preaching. And so it's very telling. There, it has come under criticism and under fire from other religious leaders in the, in the black community. But I see that less as them criticizing and them being more afraid of airing the dirty laundry because I, the, the black community and the black church as a whole, I equate to the emperor with his new clothes. He's naked, you know, he's very arrogant. He doesn't realize that his business is showing. But, and you can't tell him that. And no one, no one can tell them that their dirt is showing. And it seems that in our communities, um, this, this level of especially this one over here the and, and again these are very good looking guys they look very successful sexy or what have you and they they appear to be doing something good for the community but as we can as we as we know over a period of time it is it is basically it boils down to all style and no substance well, let me pull up the presentation here Okay, now the, now the preacher. The preacher is very revered in the black community. Most, it's been, the, the church is full of women. And so the preacher with his lavish lifestyle caters to the emotionally gullible and emotionally uh, dependent. 
and uh, has, again, nice, nice car, nice, nice clothes, nice lifestyle off of the backs of their parishioners, they're not much different from a pimp. <laughs> Which also has, the pimp culture has been very prevalent in the black community, especially during the 70s with their very gaudy lifestyle. Um, also, they prey on the emotionally weak and gullible, primarily women. And they also, per, they also claim to be fulfilling a need for, this, for these women and the community. And they also claim for God to be their God. Is there much of a difference? Not really. <laughs> the most common scandals in the black community, extramarital affairs for a community to hold religion so high and this, this platform of morality so high. There is an extraordinary amount of, 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 of an extraordinary amount of dirt that takes place that no one wants to talk about in detail or as a means of change. You have a lot of what I call quote, quote unquote illegitimate children. A lot of, a lot of there are a lot of uh, children born out of wedlock in, in our communities. Another, um, this, is, this, is a, this is an issue that is spoken to but not as religion as it, as it pertains to being a problem. Misappropriation of church funds and embezzlement, you see a lot of that in, in these black churches and in these communities. And abuse. Um, the show Preachers of LA may show only, a, they, they'll only portray a certain aspect of dysfunction as it pertains to the lifestyle, as it pertains to these problems that these preachers and their families may have. But there are countless numbers of pastors and, and people in the religious community that, you know, that perpetuate all forms of abuse that is not discussed. And it has bred, uh, it, it really has bred uh, a lot of problems in our communities that again, you know, no one will touch for the sake of saving face or for the sake of looking moral or looking presentable. Some of the scandalous pastors and leaders in the black community, I could, we could probably be here all day discussing that. But I will just only name a few. You have Eddie Long out of Atlanta uh, from New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. In 2010, um, actually, yes, 2010, he came under scrutiny because he, uh, for coercing young men uh, for sexual favors. And these men were, these, these guys were members of his church. Um, he took them on private trips to different countries under the guise of mentorship. And uh, for those of you who may not know, in 2004, he led a march with George Bush against same-sex marriage. So how, how, how ironic is that? Now, um, I think he's had members that have left his church, but you still have quite a few of them that supported him because they say, you know, he's a human, you know, he should, he should be forgiven by God like everyone else, but yet they had been, they had to have been a regular member, the, you know, they may not have been as forgiving. Um, this woman here, I cannot stand, I wish I had some pictures, um, Juanita, By Juanita Bynum. Uh, she and her husband, uh, former husband, Thomas Weeks, had a ministry in the Atlanta area. Uh, this woman, uh, she drew thousands of women in particular to her, uh, to her ministry. Under, under the guise of being, you know, empowering to women, especially under, for, for God. But, you know, something, my sixth sense, I have a sixth sense about these types of people and, and what they tend to hide. And sure enough, uh, she and her husband separated and divorced and they, there, was a, there was a big story about how he assaulted her um, after they tried to reconcile. And she became sort of a poster child for domestic violence but even you know in her she also hid some um you know some uh, homo you know, i would say homosexual but yet yeah, same same gender loving um affairs of her own and also she is she's uh she's notorious because she um so tried to solicit 
uh, $20,000 for uh, $20,000 in donations for a prayer rug. Yeah. Um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he is one of the leaders of the, he was one of the leaders of the Nation of Islam during the 1950s and 60s. And um, good, a good reading for, or a good read up on him is the autobiography of Malcolm X, who was one of my heroes. And um, for an individual who came from such a, he only finished um, eighth, in eighth grade in his education, but in his life, he was able to use Islam as a, as a means of transformation for himself. But whenever he would debate with people, he could always back up his sources. It wasn't just about religion, but it was also about the condition of, of blacks in our communities, as well as the injustices that we faced. So he was, he was very much a dynamic leader and um, a good reading for, um, it's good to read his autobiography. Now, Elijah Muhammad, um, <laughs> um, he was known for another one having illegitimate affairs. Um, he had uh, numerous children by some of his secretaries in the Nation of Islam and was very, um, was, was very notorious for dismissing anyone who was uh, found guilty of or who was accused of adultery. So um, he and, and Malcolm X was one of the leaders who found out, who felt that he should be held accountable for it, but the other leaders in the Nation of Islam preferred to sweep it under the rug. And that this is something that people don't like to talk about when it comes to, um, to this gentleman. But he's also another one. Uh, this one here, Jamal Bryant, he is a, a minister out of the Baltimore area. Uh, recently, he uh, he had issues with his his uh, significant other having affairs and also being physically abusive. And um, you know, he's I don't I don't really know too much about him, but if you if you really do look him up, he's another one of those dynamic preachers who has a huge congregation in the black community, but also under the circumstances, he is still ministering. And uh, another one that people don't like to talk about, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We, we love this man. Again, I do not deny the greatness you know, that, that is him. But J. Edgar Hoover, in his crusade against communism and trying to prove Martin Luther King Jr. to be a communist, would record sessions with Dr. King. And he didn't get evidence of communism but that he got evidence of his infidelity. And J. Edgar Hoover was actually bold enough to send these recordings to his wife. And uh, now, did she up, raise up, and, and leave him? No, she didn't. She felt that the movement was more important. And to an extent, I, I can't disagree with that. But again, this is, a, this is a legacy, or this is an aspect of his life that not many people know about. He definitely was a scandalous individual. <laughs> of all of the major and racial, racial and ethnic groups in the United States, blacks are the most likely to report a formal religious affiliation. This is part of the reason why there is a small number of open black atheists just in case you had any questions as to why that is. The black church has reportedly generated over $420 billion since 1980. Now for a community that, that has, report, has reported poverty levels, this is a huge amount of money. And, for, and, and, and the question has been asked, where have those dollars gone? Why, ha why, is the community, why is the black community not in a better position or, a, or in a better condition? Because that amount of money would certainly you know, help. Blacks have a substantial or disproportionately larger prevalence of conditions such as HIV AIDS, teen pregnancy, high blood pressure, diabetes, etc. Some of, uh, many of these conditions are preventable. And what is scary is that at the, the black church being at the root of our communities, for these numbers to be so disproportionately high, 
it speaks to the lack of education and the, and the willful ignorance that is being perpetuated by these leaders onto their members and into the community. So, and for people like T.D. Jakes, for example, who in the Dallas area that um, Aaron Ra mentioned for the seven uh, churches that were probably bigger than the arena in Melbourne, I'm pretty sure his is one of them because he has a huge congregation in the Dallas area and he's a, he's, he's a astronomic, the, actually the, the um, issue of Jet Magazine that I was featured in, he was on the cover. And it was supposed to have been, um, it was supposed to have been a feature on different faiths and philosophies, but it just came down to Christianity. And then just the, which I was appreciative of the page that they did about me and black non-believers and atheism, because it was objective, but they definitely spoke to the majority, which were the Christians. Now, there was a time where T.D. Jakes did not speak about HIV AIDS or awareness about these issues because it wasn't in the Bible. Now, for, again, the, the government and for and, and certain community initiatives can only do but so much. For this to be such an astronomic force in our community, there is, and for them to be generating billions of dollars, there is some accountability that they need to have for their, um, for their lack of um, progressive, for them being progressive and taking progressive measures in our community. There has to be some accountability there. And it's actually pretty dangerous because when you ignore these things that are going on and you know that people in your congregation are suffering from it, but yet you're probably demonizing them because of your moral stance, then of course nothing is going to get better. And the sources come from Pew Research, Centers for Disease Control, and Live Seeds. Black women make up the highest number of religious and church going and have the highest number in health disparities. And this is one of the reasons why I use black women on the cover, because we really do make up, as a collective, we do make up the majority of the religious community, but yet we're the ones suffering and not really getting the help that we need. And some of it is willful because they're choosing to hold on to this emotional dynamic as opposed to doing things logically. Where does it come from? First, we cannot deny the legislation and notion that blacks were not considered human beings during the, um, during the formation of the United States. Make no mistake, when the founding fathers said that all men were created equal, they were not speaking of women, and they certainly were not speaking to black men and women. And when we hold up think of heroes such as Thomas Jefferson, which when he said question, um, gosh, I cannot remember the exact quote, but he said um, something about question with um, fervorance, even the existence of a God. I'm sorry? Question with boldness. Yes, question with boldness, even the existence of a God. This was a man who did own slaves and who did carry on an affair with one of his slaves, which produced children. And for centuries, there were, there were legal battles as to the recognition of his children from the slaves. Christianity being imposed as a religion and justification for enslavement with the image of a white God and white culture as the standard. And one thing I will say that even other whites suffer from this ideal, this ideal image of what is considered beauty. So when you have uh, when you have a race of people who has to forego whatever images of the gods that they came with and, and imposed on them this image of a white Jesus, imagine what it does for someone's self-esteem and self-worth and to reinforce that with the notion that you are subservient not only to your, this, this god as a master but also to your master. So again, over the course of a few centuries, you know, in, in the, the imposition of this notion of Christianity and this, this subservience has done a number on the mentality and the psyche of black people. Make no mistake about it. It does play a part. 
sexual exploitation. The institution of slavery in the United States wasn't just labor exploitive, it was very sexually exploitive. Um, there were many affairs, there were, there were slaves that were um, mated just to breed stronger slaves, which kind of reinforces the notion of the, you know, the, you know, the, the athletic, uh, the, the hyper black male to extend, and, and also the, and also the sexually hyper black female. And uh, also, even in, um, you know, it, again, there were probably numerous children that were, um, that were produced as a result of this institution whose, um, whose, whose parents they probably weren't accounted for. So, you know, it's, it's, the, this all definitely plays a part into the hypersexualization and the perceived, you know, sexualization of, of blacks. The church being established as a primary institution in the black community. Now, when you have legislation, when you had legislation which deemed blacks, first of all, not completely human, and then after slavery, you had legislation which enforced separate laws, which enforced the disfranchisement of blacks and other minorities. The church was one of the only institutions that sustained the community. Um, it was, they, they did help at some point with education. It was one of the only institutions where people could meet without, without outright getting killed. And also they provided certain services, social services. This is where people could dress their best. This is where people could, you know, could congregate and socialize without necessarily being bothered as much. So it, it definitely established itself. And, and I would say that it hijacked the civil rights movement as a, as a moral and human rights cause because so many blacks held it. And, and actually, there's, good, there's some good reading that there were many churches that, that didn't want to become a part, but it somehow still hijacked. You know, the, the whole, this whole, um, it hijacked this whole idea of civil rights being a moral and divine thing as opposed to a human rights uh, issue. And there were, many, uh, there were many people that weren't Christians who were involved with the civil rights movement, A. Philip Randolph being one of them, who is a, who is a noted African American humanist. Religious and charismatic leaders overly revered. Now, going back to slavery for a minute, the pastor was one of the only people, the only, the only slaves who had a bit more education than, than, the, than the average slave. Now people need to remember that, of course, education was not enforced during slavery. It was illegal for a slave to read and write. And the only book that was allowed to be interpreted was the Bible. So now you have a legacy of an institution that does not, that does not present itself on facts and evidence, but relies on emotion and belief. And then you, under, then you begin to understand why over the course of a few centuries, why we're still having these issues in our communities, especially with the church being at the forefront. So it, it tells a very alarming story. And some suggested reading is a Holy Lockdown by Jeremiah Kamara, Brainwash by Tom Burrell, and Moral Combat by Takibu Hutchinson. And also dependence on emotional fulfillment. As we all know, um, religion and belief in God is not um, it, it is not predicated on uh, thinking rationally, actually finding pragmatic solutions. It is an emotional tool. And for historically, for blacks, with the institution of slavery, with the institution of seg with segregation and all of the injustices that were faced, there was a heavy reliance on belief in God because, again, you had legislation and actual, um, and actual uh, laws in place that helped perpetuate segregation and, uh, and racism. So with this, with, this, with this factor, then it is understandable as to why so many blacks relied on the church as an emotional tool and belief in God. Now, is it justified today? No. <laughs> you know, but unfortunately, it has become such a 
it, it has become such a, I wouldn't say nonsensical, but, but perhaps because it's one of those things that people just tend to do just because it's been a part of the community for so long. Now, getting into the price of sanctimony, the, the black church does take, like, like many other uh, forms of Christianity, the black church especially takes a stance on um, homosexuality. It, it's very anti-LGBT, very anti-birth control, very anti-progressive, um, and, and, uh, and, and as far as healthy, healthy outlooks on sexuality. So, so many people in this community think that they are far removed from some of these issues because they're blessed and highly favored, which is a term that I hate immensely. <laughs> the price of sanctimony and thinking that you are somehow covered by your God or by your belief, it helps, it perpetuates a false sense of image and prestige. It, it, it makes you think that you are far removed or only those people do those types of things. You know, how, oh, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't be, or, or, or my child or my person, you know, they, they would never do that, you know, because they're, they're Christian or they're whatever. <laughs> they tend to overlook crucial issues that need to be addressed. When people are afraid or they're so oblivious to certain problems or the, because they don't want to talk about them, they don't get any better and there are no practical solutions that are put in place. But so they just sweep them under the rug. Even in the climate of these religious people and these pastors doing all of these things, they see them but they act like they don't see. And there's also a sense of removal from, from such issues that, oh, they don't affect me even if they don't affect you directly. For example, even, even if you may not know someone who is suffering from certain issues or they, you don't know that they may have a family member suffering from them, it doesn't necessarily mean you aren't affected by them. You know, it is, it is always good for us to at least gain a better outlook as to what may be going on around us instead of just what's going on in our immediate circle because we're all affected by it some way or another. It also adheres to the good girl notion. You know, we talked about, uh, Aaron talked about Miley Cyrus earlier. And, um, and the, I know that in the community, there's a bit of discussion about the song Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke and, and also, her, um, also her performance. Now, I can definitely understand why some people, how they can uh, see those lyrics as being somewhat damaging. But I can also say for myself, having been raised to be the good girl who wasn't supposed to be out having sex, who wasn't supposed to enjoy sex, or who was supposed to be more refined in how I approached it, I understand where the song is coming from, from that aspect. Because in order to, in order to push those lines, so to speak, about what is considered appropriate or what is, especially for women, because there is this, it's almost this double, there's this double standard of how we're supposed to act and carry ourselves and how we're supposed to approach sex. We're not supposed to be lewd or open with it. And we're supposed to just be these, these quiet, neat beings. And I definitely disagree to that. So I think that when you talk about the good girl and what is supposed to good, good girls don't do these things openly. And, and I definitely think that there needs to be some challenges to that. So getting on what we can do, um, going back to uh, the women's rights for a moment, um, there, was, there is a noted, um, one of my heroines uh, is Ida B. Wells. If you've never heard of her, she was a journalist um, during the reconstruct after the Reconstruction period, who wrote a lot about um, who wrote a lot about uh, lynching and trying to fight against lynching uh, against uh, blacks and others who were unfairly um, convicted and accused, especially of of poisoning white womanhood, if you will. Back in those days, it was very common race mixing or an interracial um, 
dating and, and sex was very common, but of course it was against the law. But a black person could easily be convicted and hanged for having sex with a white woman, even on a false accusation of rape. So, um, and she also worked with uh, Susan B. Anthony during, and, and also, and during, the, um, during the women's rights movement. Even though she was a believer, she did challenge uh, the notions of how the church was handling this. And, also, and she was also one of the founding mem members of the NAACP. So what is it that we can do to help turn this around? Re-education for adults and sensible dialogue with, with children and teenagers. Many adults have been, have been fed a very diluted, uh, diluted sense of sex and sexuality and notion of sexuality. And they're passing it down to the teens and the children. And we're not seeing the conditions get any better. There have been many women, many family members that I've grown up with who have started having children as teenagers, and now their children are having children as teenagers. So even as they may rise within the church leadership and administration, the other issues aren't getting any better. So there, there definitely needs to be a more healthier outlook and, and re-education for adults um, as far as sex and sexuality is concerned. And there have been many, um, there have been many notions that, oh well, you know, if this, I'm sure this is true in, in many other communities, but in the black community, if you know that you have a shady family member, it's like, oh, just stay away from so-and-so, he crazy. But no, it's not just that he's crazy, he may need some help or he may need to be put away and he needs to stay away from certain children. Now, I, I was, reminded of, a, um, I was remi reminded of a story yesterday about a church whose pastor was convicted of pedophilia, but instead of removing him from the church, they decided to ban all children from the church while he continued to pastor. So again, we're, we're looking at a very skewered, for the lack of a better word, sense of responsibility here. If you can ban the children from the church, which probably would end up being better because they don't need to go there anyway. <laughs> but to have this man still minister to people, give advice, these, these people give advice about how you should live their life, how, how they should live their lives, but yet people are scapegoating what they're doing with their lives. They're not holding their leaders accountable. So this is a, very, this is a huge problem here. So there definitely needs to be re-education. And I say re-education. And also, too, let me just say that um, I, I was going to throw in statistics about like, higher education and blacks. But there are, a, a, there are a high number of blacks in higher educations or higher institutions of learning. But as people like Dr. Ben Carson proved just this past week, just because you have a higher education or formal education, it doesn't necessarily make you smarter. Especially when he can, when he can compare Obamacare to slavery as a neuroscientist. So that, that says a lot. And then when we have teachers and educators still teaching creationism in our schools, that also speaks to a level of higher education that isn't nece necessarily transferring to intelligence. Implement appropriate accountability for abuse. And this, just, this goes back to what I just spoke about before. Instead of sweeping these problems under the rug, especially with these religious leaders, uh, there needs to be, definitely needs to be more legal action against them. Uh, they need to be held, you know, definitely more accountable uh, if they need treatment or even just outright removal from these institutions. This is what needs to happen. But unfortunately, the parishioners hold them in such, again, they hold them in such high regard that they're willing to overlook it for um, just for the sake of appearing to be okay. Therapy for those affected by any form of abuse. Unfortunately, the black community turns, turns down, a, it, it really, really looks down on mental health issues. It looks down on therapy. It, it looks down on these approaches to, um, 
to improvement. And part of that is there's a lot of miscon there's a lot of misconceptions about the medical community. There are a lot of black people who actually look at Margaret Sanger as being someone who was trying to sterilize women, which I which we know is false, but understand that this is how this community is looking at it. And there definitely needs to be more of a pragmatic and um, an approach to uh, definitely proper education about these people, but understand that this is what the community thinks. And it's going to take a joint effort for us to, 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 put, a for, to put forth the, the, the real information about these people. And also, going back to the Tuskegee syphilis experiment in Tuskegee, Alabama, the, the after effects of that experiment are long lasting because what happened was, while no one was intentionally injected with syphilis, the, the studies irresponsibly conducted studies on these, on these men long after penicillin was found to be, a, to be a cure for this disease. And so they continued to study these men who were poor and who really had no knowledge outside of what these doctors were telling them. So they finally ended it after a study from, from the 1930s to the 1970s. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, the information, the details about the study came to light. So it is understandable how it was perceived to be a racist study because they were using poor blacks. And so people take this information and they, and they, they qualify it to the entire medical community as if, as, it, as if it doesn't work and if it's racist against blacks. Have there been racist studies? Probably. But the, but the, the, the methodology itself uh, is not racist or it shouldn't be considered racist. And the scientific method should not be considered racist or, or faulty just, just because there have been a few bad apples. Eliminating shaming tactics and abstinence only education. Um, I think the state of Mississippi uh, enacts, uh, their education system enacts um, abstinence only education. And I think they have one of the highest rates of teenage pregnancy. Something isn't working. And I think when you, put a, when, you, when you put forth unrealistic expectations about sex, especially when it comes to teenagers and people who are discovering themselves, especially when you, when you put forth these fear, you know, these, these fear tactics as if sex is something to be feared and, and to be scared of and ashamed of, you end up creating the opposite effect. And um, it's telling, again, in the numbers, in the high pregnancy rates, in the high disease rates, that something about abstinence-only education is just, it's a setup for failure. It also, is, this whole purity thing, too, is also, for, for, for women or for, for people who have been abused, it, make, it may make them feel shameful that they haven't kept their purity to an extent and somehow they are unfavorable in the eyes of the Lord or in the community. So, and how is that their fault because an adult did something like that to them? So just imagine what type of stigma that it creates. Also, I, know, I don't think I fit the, even though some would disagree, I, I, I know I don't necessarily think I would fit the standard of beauty as far as um, in the United States. You know, I'm, you know, black female would be considered, you know, I'm full figure or BBW, as some people uh, say. But um, shaming tactics of any kind, whether it is about body image, whether it is about your sexual expression, or even your sexual identity, um, these shaming tactics need to end. And also more, better education about what it is to be a member of the LGBT community or even just about sex in general should definitely, um, should definitely be applied, especially to communities that may not have, even though there's, 
There's tons of access. There's tons of access that in, the, in this age of information and the internet, there should be no reason why anyone is willfully ignorant. But when you have a controlling entity like the church and certain parents who have been raised in these churches and are carrying on detrimental, uh, detrimental positions about morality and sex, then it becomes a problem. So, yeah, eliminate the do as I say and not as I do tactics. Uh, it's, it's tempting for parents in general to say do as I say, not as I do, but trust me, the children are watching. I, I watched my mother as she told me to do as she said, but not as she did. And I think in her, I learned about how to hide certain things about myself and uh, to be what is considered the lady in the street and the freak in the sheets. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and I think sometimes that's good. I, 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 I honestly don't think everyone needs to know everything about what you do sexually. They, they don't because most people are just small-minded to begin with and they hold on to these hang-ups that they have that they were brought up with and um, also unresolved issues and so people tend to be pretty judgmental, as we, can, as we know, as a community. But even within our own community, we tend to be judgmental as well. But as parents and as, um, and as people, you know, we definitely should not follow a do as I say, not as I do mentality. Acknowledge the disparities, acknowledge the racism, acknowledge the sexism. It has not gone away. For as much as we like to think it has, it really, really hasn't. One thing about I can say about a President Obama's um, term as president is that it has really brought out a lot of hidden racism in these past few years, and people can hide it and say that they don't like they they don't like the Affordable Health Care Act because of whatever reason. The bottom line is that. Some of these people just do not like him because he is black, or that he is from, or that he is a person of color. Now, some people may want to deny that, but you know, actions do tell a lot more than their words say. And also, let's not acknowledge, let, let's not deny the fact that there are issues in separate communities that, that we have to tackle even within the free thought community. Yes, we're all atheists, we may be humanists, we may have a common goal, but when we have separate issues as, as stated, if I say, if you've never seen that Preachers of LA show, hopefully it has given some insight into the uphill battle that we face with, with, with religion and the, and the notion in our communities. If you've never seen it before, you've seen it now. And reiterate that sexual desire is normal and healthy. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter is 15 years old. She'll be 16 in December. She identifies as bisexual. And she, she gets excellent grades in school. She's an AB honors student. I have never told her that she, I actually, she went on her first date when she was 12 years old. And the reason for that is because that's when she started expressing an interest in the opposite sex. So, and, and it was interesting because her, her, her date was a Vietnamese boy whose parents, she said, did not like black people. And he couldn't even tell them that he was going on a date with her. And so, but what, what ended up happening is she no longer speaks to this. She no longer speaks to this kid. And she's gotten the whole puppy love thing out of her system. And I think something that we, we fail to realize, and then I, I know for myself, again, I, I discovered sexual desire at an early age, probably before I hit puberty. Many of these other children do too. Whether we want to realize it or not, they do. And as a parent, the worst thing you can do is give in to your fears and, and, and silence them and be silent yourself. It's good for us to tell them about how we felt as, as, as children and as teenagers so that not to scare them, 
but to help them realize that where you once where you are i once was and it's okay that it is oh it is okay if you express interest in the opposite sex or even the same sex there's nothing wrong with that you know i told my daughter when she was 12 and when she first when she first started menstruating that she would be interested in boys she said ew but <laughs> But that was something that was something more than my mother told me. She told me the basics. But as far as the feelings and such, you know, she didn't want me to end up like her being a single mom, living in a how living in the projects and raising children out of wedlock, which is something that I don't necessarily think is wrong either. But I think that more 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 uh, practical approaches and more progressive ideas towards sex and sexuality is important. I, for one, encourage open relationships. I encourage I encourage sex before marriage. I believe you should try before you buy. <laughs> because because it is such an important whether we realize it or not, you know, sex is important to our lives and to our well beings. And it's important for us to know what pleases us, what excites us, and, 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 and not go by someone else's definition of what, is, of what is considered standard or appropriate. It is good for us to look at different, different ideas and different measures. And you know, I really wouldn't have a problem with what these pastors do, with what these religious people do if they didn't stand on a platform of morality. One of the preachers who I say looks like, are you familiar with the group The Whispers, the R&B group, anyone? Okay, there was an R&B group in the 70s called The Whispers. You'll probably know their songs if you hear them. There are two twins that are Walter and Scotty. The, the, the preacher who had the, um, you know, the, the, the suit on that had the big mustache kind of looks like one of them. He said in the last episode that I watched that uh, he was trying to minister to the younger couple, and he said he followed God's blueprint for marriage. Well, if you follow God's blueprint for marriage, you're probably the biggest hoe out there. <laughs> Seriously. So they, they say these things very, you know, they, they, say these, they, they say them, you know, they, they spew this rhetoric it starts sounding like they start sounding like broken records. They start they start sounding very contrived, and especially since they're they're they seem to come from or they're trying to come from a place of what's right or what's considered moral, but at the end they end up looking like fools to, to those of us who have who have used um, have used our brains somewhat. But it's good for us to you know to look at this and look at this dynamic understand where we're coming from, understand what is at stake here, and, and to try to help us improve things for, for the better. Thank you. Did I run up my, I run up my Q&A time? <laughs>